En primer término, quiero agradecer muy sinceramente al comité organizador de este decimoquinto Congreso Latinoamericano de Genética por hacerme merecedor del privilegio de presentar al profesor Phillips C. Hanawalt, profesor titular del Departamento de Biología de la Universidad de Stanford. El profesor Hanawalt recibió su grado de bachiller en ciencias en el Oberlin College en 1954, su magíster en ciencias en 1955 y su Ph.D. en biofísica en 1959, estos dos últimos grados académicos por la Universidad de Yale. En 1960 se trasladó hasta Copenhagen y en 1961 al Departamento de Biofísica de Caltech para un entrenamiento postdoctoral en Biología Molecular y Genética. Como estudiante graduado, trabajó en el laboratorio del profesor Setlow en la Universidad de Yale, junto a quien pudieron brindar sustento cuantitativo de los efectos inhibitorios de la luz ultravioleta sobre la síntesis de ADN en Escherichia coli, sugiriendo que los mecanismos de recuperación pueden restituir la síntesis de ADN. El doctor Hanawalt ha sido un investigador muy productivo en el campo de la reparación de ADN, desde su descubrimiento pionero sobre Repair Replication en Escherichia coli en 1963. Como pueden apreciar en la diapositiva, más de 12 descubrimientos en el área de la reparación de ADN han sido llevados a cabo en su laboratorio de Stanford, mismos que han sido publicados en más de 480 escritos en revistas de alto impacto, tales como Nature, Science, el Journal of Molecular Biology, Mutation Research y otras. El Dr. Hannah Walt ha recibido numerosos reconocimientos, distinciones y premios en diferentes partes del mundo, incluyendo los doctorados honoris causa otorgados por la Universidad del Bio Bio en 2006, Universidad de Sevilla en 2008 y Universidad de Buenos Aires en 2012 a propósito de su participación en las trigésimas Jornadas Argentinas de Toxicología realizada la semana recién pasada en la ciudad capital. Su pasión por la ciencia y su personalidad genuina y de caballero lo han convertido en un líder indiscutido en el campo de la reparación de ADN por alrededor de 50 años. Finalmente, todos quienes conocemos al Dr. Hanawalt podemos afirmar que no solo es un científico de perfil global, sino además un gran caballero con una hermosa familia. Nuestro reconocimiento a su grupo, a su señora esposa, la doctora Graciela Spiva, que se encuentra acá con nosotros, y a sus dos hijos, David y Steve, y a sus dos nietos, Tate and Phillips. Esta tarde, el profesor Hanawalt dictará la conferencia Lesion Sensing and Decision Points in the DNA Damage Response. Señoras y señores, en este magnífico congreso, un gigante entre gigantes. Por favor, recibamos con un caluroso aplauso al doctor Philip C. Hanawalt. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Enrique and uh, sh showing both my scientific family and my family family, some of them. Okay. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to <coughs> speak to you this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about lesion sensing and decision points in the DNA damage response. Maintenance of the genome and its accurate replication are prerequisites for life. Transcription is also essential for cell function. The threats to cells include DNA structure alterations that affect translocation of polymerases or the accuracy of the processes of replication and transcription. I will discuss uh, the cellular processing of damaged DNA with some historical introduction. 
I will then give something of the immense complexity of the global DNA repair process in humans. I will then focus on the sub-pathway of transcription coupled DNA repair in active genes that was discovered in my laboratory uh, several decades ago. I will mention several human diseases due to DNA repair deficiencies, and then we'll turn to consideration of transcription arrest at unusual DNA se sequences that can form particular non-canonical DNA structures. And finally, I want to discuss the possibility of a gratuitous form of transcription coupled repair that could be deleterious and lead to human disease. We begin with examples of DNA damage, which can be mutagenic and carcinogenic. Uh, many of these occur naturally during uh, growth of any cells. These include strand breaks, deamination of cytosine to uracil, which makes, it, of course, a point mutation, loss of purines, you will lose one trillion guanines during the course of my lecture. Not because of it, but it will happen. Other types of damage are inflicted by environmental radiations and genotoxic chemicals, uh, causing such things as methylation of the O6 position of guanine, uh, making it code as though it were an adenine, bulky adducts to DNA, such as uh, processed chemicals leading to uh, benzpyrin dialepoxide, leading a very distorting DNA adduct. Uh, oxidative damage, uh, over a dozen different types of base modifications occur due to endogenous oxidative free radicals. And again, these occur all the time in all living cells. Some types of damage, like interstrand cross-linking, can be particularly serious. And finally, the classic test lesion by which excision repair was discovered is the cyclobutane pyrimidine dimer connecting two adjacent purines through their hydrogen bonds or a more distorting structure called the 6-4 photoproduct where they're turned 90 degrees with respect to each other leading to much greater DNA distortion that's more easily recognized by repair. Watson and Crick reflected upon their double helical structure for DNA in 1954. They appreciated the likely mechanism for semi-conservative replication, but missed the fact that one DNA strand could serve as a template for repair of the complementary one. It was 10 years later that the pathway of excision repair was first reported in which damage such as a pyrimidine dimer could be recognized by several proteins, except we didn't know which proteins, first of all, uh, could be cut out of the DNA and replaced by a repair patch using the information in the complementary DNA strand and the suggested uh, steps we um, suggested at that point are these, and that turned out to be correct. We now know that six proteins can carry out this process in E. coli. Uh, Dick Setlow, my former uh, do uh, doctoral mentor, and his colleagues discovered that the damage is cut out of the DNA. My first graduate student, David Pettijohn, and I discovered that repair patches are put in. It was three years later that Martin Gellert discovered a final enzyme ligase needed to connect the repair patch to the contiguous parental DNA strand. We now know of many DNA repair processes, uh, and this summarizes essentially all of them. The simplest ones involve just direct reversal of damage, but this is only for certain types types of <coughs> lesions. Primidine dimers can be reversed directly without breaking the DNA backbone by an enzyme photolyase that binds to the damage in the dark 
and then is activated by visible light. Now, unfortunately, we humans do not still have such an enzyme that many other organisms do. Another one is the direct removal of the methyl from O6-methylguanine by an alkyl transferase. This is a very expensive repair process because it's a suicide enzyme. One enzyme removes one methyl and then that enzyme is no longer useful. So you make an entire protein just to remove one methyl from one guanine. That shows how important this repair must be. Nucleotide excision repair is probably the most versatile. It deals with many types of lesions that distort the DNA structure or that simply weaken the stability of the DNA structure. Base excision repair, a uh, modification of this is involved um, as an initiated, initiated by a glycosylase, which removes the inappropriate base, such as uracil in DNA, or a damaged base, leaving an abasic site that is subsequently processed. Mismatch repair, the third type of excision repair, deals with mismatched bases or small loops in DNA, and in particular, with errors made during nucleotide incorporation during replication. Some types of damage where two lesions are close together, closely spaced on the opposite strands, additionally requires recombinational modes to deal with it, such as homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining or single strand annealing. This includes double strand breaks, interstrand crosslinks, and also the situation when a replication fork encounters a single strand break. Finally, translesion synthesis is a mode that is not really repair, but rather a tolerance mode for bypassing lesions, usually in an error prone manner. Now, there's crosstalk and overlap <coughs> between the different repair pathways. Pathways may compete with each other for the same lesion, and each step in a pathway generates an intermediate that may be susceptible to intervention by enzymes from another pathway. Overall damage processing, then, can be considered in terms of successive stages of DNA repair with decision points at each stage until the DNA integrity is finally reestablished, usually by the ligase connection of a repair patch. The outcome for the cell and for the organism of which it is a part may depend upon which protein encounters the lesion first. Here are just a few examples of DNA repair pathway overlap. I'd mentioned an abasic site that results from spontaneous depurination or as an intermediate in base excision repair. This can be incised by an apurinic endonuclease or by AP lyase activity, or it can be a substrate for nucleotide excision repair. The mismatch repair ends another example. The mismatch repair enzyme MUTE-S also binds to O6-methylguanine competing with the alkyl transferase, but it results in a cytotoxic feudal cycle. The alkyl transferase-like protein, so-called ATLs, also bind O6-methyl-G, but they can't remove the methyl. However, by binding to the, to the O6-methylguanine, they serve as antennae to recruit enzymes for nucleotide excision repair. The photolyase binds to the cyclobutane dimer in the dark. If you don't turn on the light, it enhances recognition of the lesion for nucleotide excision repair. And finally, in general, mismatch repair proteins recognize some types of lesions, and correspondingly, nucleotide excision repair recognizes some mismatch base pairs. This slide is a very basic overview of the DNA damage response in human cells. We have the endogenous lesions happening all the time. Most of them are repaired, but there's still a steady state level of some lesions. 
cells respond to this by carrying out translesion synthesis, but in doing so, they make mistakes. We add environmental damage and therapeutic damage, such as in treatment for cancer. DNA repair deals with this damage, but there are additional lesions, different types of lesions. The cells are usually overwhelmed with the damage and they respond to it by uh, activating cell cycle checkpoint um, pathways, such as those governed by ATM that responds to double strand breaks and ATR that deals largely with damage that arrests replication. And a prominent pathway that this leads into is that um, governed by the uh, DNA uh, can cancer suppressor gene P53, which is mutated in over 50% of human cancers. This in turn <clears throat> is involved in the cell cycle arrest, in apoptotic pathways for severely damaged cells, and also in upregulating DNA repair, in particular excision repair. Okay, this is the simple view. Now I'm going to rapidly show you several slides that just illustrate the complexity we're dealing with. Let's take ATR. What do we know about, or actually, let's take ATM. What do we know about ATM? Okay, here are the proteins ATM interacts with. How do you start studying this? Well, uh, let's take a simpler view. Let's just only look at the ones that where there are functional links shown. This is called a spike map, standing for Signaling Pathways Integrated Knowledge Engine. I think they started with spike and then tried to figure out which words might go with it. But here we've got ATM, and let's see if we can find P53. Oh yeah, here it is, P53. Where do we go from here? Well, let's look at a spike map for P53. Here are the targets of P53. Uh, let's choose the ones we're going to work on. For my talk, we're only going to look at this one, XPC, and DDB2. Forget about the rest for the moment. Is this complex? Well, let's look at P53, the protein. It's modified after synthesis, as many proteins are, most are perhaps. It is modified by being phosphorylated, acetylated, ubiquitinated, and sumulated at various sites. These are well mapped now. Um, so that's yet a further level of complexity. And if that weren't enough, the final one is the modifications in P53 depend on how the cells were stressed. So UV irradiated cells are phosphorylated at these sites, dephosphorylated at some, acetylated at these sites, if you compare it to ionizing radiation-treated cells, you get a somewhat different pattern, not that different. But say for hydrogen peroxide, oxidative damage, you get a very different pattern. You have to bear these in mind if you are going to analyze P53 protein and study how it operates. Coming back to uh, something easier to talk about, uh, the cancer-prone leaf Romani syndrome. It's a rare autosomal dominant disease involving germline mutations in P53 in most cases. As I mentioned, it's a tumor suppressor. It regulates many genes involved in growth and DNA repair, including DDB2 that I pointed out just a minute ago, needed for efficient nucleotide excision repair of CPDs and some other types of damage. Nucleotide, deficient, uh, nucleotide excision repair is deficient in patients with leaf from any syndrome. In this study, uh, carried out by um, Krista Bowman and Deanna Sicard from Columbia, um, they studied global repair of CPDs and, si and this distorting lesion, 6,4 photoproduct, in normal cells and those transformed by SP40, in which abrogates P53. Clearly, this doesn't have any marked effect on repair of the distorting lesion, but it nearly totally eliminates repair of CPDs. Perhaps more um, 
relevant to us is that if we now look at global repair of benzopyrene dilapoxide adducts in human fibrous, fibroblasts at the levels found in the lungs of smokers, this was determined by the sensitive technique of P32 post-labeling, and the result is quite clear that in the presence of P53, we get a uh, marked loss of the uh, adduct in two, two days, but in the, without P53, we get hardly any repair in that period. Okay, let's go on now to another aspect of repair. What if the lesion is encountered by replication or transcription <coughs> before it has had a chance to be repaired? First of all, in this case, you don't get a product until the lesion's been repaired, or alternatively, if there's been translesion synthesis. Furthermore, there's restricted access for repair enzymes to the lesion because these complexes are very large. We have mapped the complex of, T, of, of um, RNA polymerase II at a pyrimidine dimer. It extends about 10 nucleotides ahead of the dimer, about 25 nucleotides behind it. So you've got to get this complex out of the way in order to even repair the damage. Furthermore, Translesion synthesis, when it can occur, can be fatal if the lesion happens to be a strand break. In the case of replication, humans have at least 15 or 16 different DNA polymerases, of which most are dedicated to bypassing different types of damage. So, for example, one of them, called Paul Ada, is quite specific for cyclobutane pyrimidine dimers, and it replicates through dimers with a greater fidelity, much greater fidelity, than it replicates undamaged DNA. In the case of transcription, there are no alternative RNA polymerases, so this is the only show in town, and either the polymerase is going to have to be able to get past the lesion or somehow it's going to be, have to be repaired. <coughs> so there are two pathways, two sub-pathways of nucleotide excision repair. Global genomic repair that I've been talking about that deals with lesions throughout the genome, but of course has the problem of opening up chromatin to get to the lesion. And then there's transcription coupled repair that's specifically deals with lesions in the transcribed strands of expressed genes, its likely purpose is to remove arrested RNA polymerases that otherwise would block replication forks and or generate strong signals for apoptosis. And as I may have mentioned, arrested transcription, if not dealt with rapidly, leads to a strong signal for apoptosis of the cells. There's another reason to remove arrested RNA polymerases blocked at dimers, and that's to preclude high levels of deamination of cytosine. In dimers containing the uh, pyrimidine cytosine, they tend to get deaminated rapidly when they're in the dimerized form. Now, <clears throat> modern technology enables us to determine the complete genome sequence in cells from a tumor. And as an example, in recent studies from Michael Stratton's laboratory, they've sequenced uh, somatic mutations from a human cancer genome from melanoma, where they can determine the uh, mutational signature, which not surprisingly is that you would expect from UV damage to DNA. But in the same study, they show that the repair has been preferentially deployed toward transcribed regions. In parallel, they looked at a lung tumor and showed, again, that the signature is that you would expect from uh, uh, the damage you would expect from uh, smoke, tobacco smoke, and the effects of transcription coupled repair are seen as well. The path 
pathway for global repair in human cells is essentially the same as in bacteria. Uh, the damage is recognized by XPC that I've mentioned and this accessory uh, protein DDB2 for some lesions is important. And then it leads into the steps of lesion verification, opening up the, a bubble and, and cutting on both sides of the bubble, putting in a repair patch and ligating it. Uh, the main difference is that in human cells it takes 30 proteins, not just six. For transcription coupled repair, the damage recognition works in an entirely different way. The arrested RNA polymerase um, recruits a protein known as CSB, which is a coupling factor, which in turn recruits other enzymes needed for processing the site, including getting the RNA polymerase out of the way, either backing it up or pulling it off the DNA so that the next steps can occur. And the next steps are common for global repair and transcription coupled repair. So the human genes implicated in the early steps of nucleotide excision repair, for global repair, we have these two that are required for that, but not for transcription coupled repair. And in turn, we have these, CSA, CSB, UVSSA, required for transcription coupled repair, but not for global repair. XP stands for xeroderma pigmentosum, the first genetic disease shown to be defective in DNA repair, as discovered by <coughs> James Cleaver in 1968. We have uh, CS standing for Cocaine syndrome, UVSS for UV sensitive syndrome. These diseases, first of all, um, patients deficient in XPC have xeroderma pigmentosum, are 1,000 to 4,000 fold more sensitive to UV and have extensive um, skin cancers. A patient defective in the translesion polymerase, Paul Beta, looks just about the same clinically, um, indicating that if you don't have the enzyme for bypassing the damage, you're just as bad off as if you cannot repair it. These other diseases, um, cocaine syndrome and trichothiodystrophy, which uh, Dr. Spivak will talk about in much more detail tomorrow, um, do not have cancer and UV sensitive syndrome patient also does not have any cancer and yet they are sensitive to sunlight. So um, what's the difference? Well, um, these, where's my pointer? Is anybody, there we go. These patients are defective in transcription coupled repair. These patients are largely defective in global repair. But the cocaine syndrome patients and trichothiodystrophy and XP also have other um, problems unrelated to the uh, skin cancer or the uh, sun sensitivity in the skin. Um, and um, the major difference here, though, is that UV sensitive syndrome only has the sun sensitive problems and has none of these other complicating problems. So we could generalize that XP, deficient in global repair or translation synthesis, highly cancer prone, cocaine syndrome, deficient in transcription coupled repair but no cancers, severe developmental neurological problems. However, UV sensitive syndrome, deficient in transcription coupled repair and no cancers, has no developmental neurological problems. GGR deficiency is mutagenic and carcinogenic. Transcription coupled repair deficiency, highly lethal, cellular lethal, but resistant to cancer, perhaps, because <coughs> 
dead cells don't form tumors, but what is the difference between Cockaine syndrome and UV sensitive syndrome? This will be discussed by Graciela Spivak in her lecture tomorrow as she has led this um, area of research. Now come to what is the precise signal that triggers transcription coupled repair? How can the system tell the difference between a natural sequence dependent encumbrance from a bona fide lesion? We've been studying effects of different DNA structural alterations on transcription with reconstituted mammalian RNA polymerase II and the simple one peptide polymerase, T7 phage RNA polymerase in vitro. This polymerase is actually a good model for the mitochondrial RNA polymerase. And we compare these effects with transcription coupled repair in vivo. First, looking at many different types of lesions, we find that when transcription is blocked by these lesions, it is generally because the damage is in the transcribed strand, TS, not in the non-transcribed strand. So CPDs are strong blocks to transcription of both polymerases when the damage is in the transcribed strand. The same is true for the 6-4 photoproduct. Uh, lesions in, caused by cisplatin uh, used uh, effectively in treating many types of tumors. Uh, also, the blockage is primarily in the transcribed strand. Melondialdehyde adducts, these are formed as uh, peroxide uh, intermediates uh, in, in cells, uh, lipid peroxidation. These also block transcription when in the transcribed strand. But curiously, these prominent oxidized bases, thymine glycol and adoxoguanine, in the studies that we've carried out, are um, essentially uh, not blockage at all, or in any case, are, are very weak blocking of transcription. So you wouldn't predict that they would be susceptible to transcription coupled repair. Although, if you go to the first intermediate and base excision repair, an abasic site is a strong block to transcription. And furthermore, an oxidized abasic site is a strong block to transcription. So perhaps it's the intermediate that is blocking transcription and might initiate transcription coupled repair. In a genetic study, Sue Jinx Robertson and her student Kim looked, uh, first of all, as I mentioned, the first step in basic excision repair generates an abasic site which could be processed through the basic excision repair pathway or nucleotide excision repair. In a mutagenic analysis in yeast with a highly transcribed gene, they showed that nucleotide excision repair was required for transcription coupled repair of an abasic site. Uh, their model system used the removal of uracil from the transcribed DNA strand and in this study, they also showed that base excision repair was needed to remove it from the non-transcribed strand. So one could ask whether this me mechanism could account for uh, a transcription coupled repair of adoxoguanine. Now, there are many types of unusual structures that occur naturally in DNA. Um, these can serve regulatory roles. They're often found in close to uh, promoters. But these naturally occurring non-canonical DNA structures can also be hot spots for mutation and genomic instability. Examples are hDNA, in which uh, there's a, a, a downstream uh, palindrome such that a uh, triplex can form thereby leaving an unhydrogen bonded single strand DNA that could be susceptible to uh, damage. There are cruciforms in which a palindrome can form a hairpin 
or in this case a cruciform, these can be stabilized, in fact, by mismatch repair proteins that can bind to these sequences and make them hard to unwind. ZDNA can occur in regions in which you have a repetitive sequence, such as CG, 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 CG. This structure, in fact, is a left-handed helix, and, and this would be the standard B DNA, the Watson Crick DNA, right-handed helix. At the junction, this flips out a guanine, which is out in the solvent and susceptible to oxidation and to other damage. Triplet nucleotide repeats can also lead to genomic instability. Expansion of CAG repeats is associated with over a dozen neurological diseases, such as Huntington's disease. Here, uh, this is a, a tragic disease. Here is an example. Uh, Scott Redford was a football star at age 18. At 32 years, he's severely affected with Huntington's disease. As I said, it involves an expansion of CAG repeats, and all of us in this room have only about 28 of these repeats in the Huntington gene, and that's normal. Those afflicted with the disease get this expanded to first up to about 35, then up to nearly 40, and then greatly over 40. You get increased numbers of repeats with each generation, with each round of replication, giving what is referred technically as genetic anticipation. So you go from this number of repeats to this number, eventually killing neurons by uh, having just a gunky uh, polyglutamine uh, structure that uh, disrupts everything and kills the cell. Now, there's a possible role of transcription or transcription-coupled repair in triplet repeat expansion. The analysis of CAG repeat lengths in Huntington's disease reveals the highest level of repeat instability in brain, low levels of repeat instability in tissues in which cell turnover is high, such as blood and intestine, suggesting that processes other than cell proliferation may be involved in the process, such as DNA repair and transcription. Arrested RNA polymerase might trigger a gratuitous transcription coupled repair. Again, these are not unusual sequences, it's just they can form unusual structures. Feudal cycles of repair could then be mutagenic if mismatch repair was not operative on the short repair patches, and repair replication itself might have lower fidelity when within regions of DNA that can form these unusual structures. There's a possible example uh, from Huntington's disease in studies from um, Lynn and um, John Wilson at Baylor University, where in a model system they studied CAG repeat contraction in human cells and found using uh, knockouts of various genes that it required mismatch repair proteins, which as I mentioned, can stabilize some hairpin structures. It required the gene XPA, which is a key uh, gene required both for global repair and transcription coupled repair. Caucanes B and TF2S, considered specific for transcription coupled repair, were also required for this process. But the key control, <coughs> key control is that XPC was not, and XPC is specific for global repair. So this phenomenon is dependent upon transcription coupled repair. An undergraduate student, Vivi Salinas Rios, in the laboratory, uh, studied this in vitro 
taking a, a repeat, 20 fold repeat of CAG, which can form this kind of an imperfect hairpin. You can see that it, it's imperfect. You have two A's trying to um, bind together. This would attract mismatch repair proteins. In a purified system with T7RNA polymerase, where um, first you just look, uh, here's a, uh, the promoter sequence, and you look at the product formed, uh, transcribing this right strand, and you get this band on an electrophoretic gel. If you've got this loop that I show here, then it's a longer piece, and so you get a longer uh, piece of uh, transcription, same if it were the, um, the Watson Crick opposite of this, or if it were a, um, a, a palind palindrome. Um, and there is no evidence for blockage at any point in this, which means that in the simple system, transcription can go through these. However, in the cell, of course, there are other proteins, including mismatch proteins that could bind to it. And when she repeated this experiment, in HeLa cell nuclear extracts, she found clearly that these structures are strong blocks to transcription. In each case, we, we look at a, a runoff, which indicates the transcription that can go through the structure and look at the shorter bands indicating that transcription has been blocked at the unusual structure. This led to a model that we've proposed for transcription-dependent repeat instability in which, as transcription moves along, when it goes through these uh, triplet repeat sequences, it tends to form these slip-outs. Um, as transcription progresses, it generates negative superhelix tension behind it which accounts for the tendency to form these slipouts. The next polymerase that comes along could arrest at either of these uh, slipouts. If it arrests at this one, here's what happens. It could arrest here, and if there were a gratuitous transcription event, it would make a patch which would follow all the way around this slipout and give rise to an expansion in the triplet repeat. On the other hand, if it came up to this slip out and blocked at this side, nothing would happen. On the other hand, if it got to this side just a little bit further, then the blockage would result in a repair patch that would actually contract the triplet repeat. Yet another non-canonical structure I haven't mentioned was studied by Sylvia Tornaletti when she was in the lab. This is a commonly known structure called a G4 or G quartet structure where you have a short run of guanines um, or separated by other nucleotides such that you can form these plates or uh, rafts structures. And she found that G4 DNA in the non-transcribed strand partially arrests RNA polymerase too. Now this structure is important as it's found in telomeres, the ends of chromosomes, and in the immunoglobulin genes, where it may have a role in generating billions of different antibodies through a transcription-dependent mutagenic process. Could that be a transcription-coupled repair event? We don't know at this point whether this G4 DNA elicits transcription coupled repair. We've looked more generally at transcription in guanine cytosine rich homopurine pyrimidine stretches. These sequences are also abundant in genomes and they're found in transcribed domains. Now, the stability of a duplex where the purine is ribonucleotide and the DNA is 
perimeter nucleotide, the stability is greater than that of the corresponding DNA duplex, which in turn is greater than the situation where it's a DNA purine and an RNA pyrimidine. So, and these sequences also can form these triplexes and quadruplexes. We wondered whether this could be a problem for removing the transcript RNA from the template. We uh, set up the system as usual. We have a, a promoter-driven transcription event. We put in our insert of interest and then determine whether, and we can have it um, strand specific, which strand is the one that contains the damage or that we would expect to cause a problem, and then determine the lengths of the transcripts made, whether it's blocked here or here, or whether it gets to the runoff, the end. When the non-transcribed strand is cytosine, that is, it's transcribing the guanine strand of 32 guanines, here's the runoff, and we don't see any shorter pieces, so it gets through fine. But if the cytosine is the transcribed strand, making a guanine product RNA, there's strong blockage at the position of the insert with particular uh, pattern. That's true for 32, 16 guanines, 12 guanines, only eight guanines, there's still significant blockage. And if you look very closely, you can even see a hint of something for only four guanines. Now, as a control, if we substitute inosine for guanosine, the yield of transcripts is reduced, but there's no pronounced blockage at all. Here we have inosine instead of guanine, and we get no blockage essentially in either strand. And the reason for this undoubtedly is that inosine pairs with cytosine, but can only form two hydrogen bonds. So it's much weaker than the bonding with guanine, which can form three hydrogen bonds. Inosine then stabilizes the RNA-DNA hybrid formed during transcription, as well as the DNA duplex. Our results suggest that nascent RNA base pairing is crucial for the blockage. Our model for transcription blockage when the template strand is C is shown here. The additional stability of the RNA-DNA within the transcription complex would impede DNA unwinding and in fact could sterically interfere with the um, unwinding and the release of the product RNA. Now obviously this is an in vitro system and cells are able to deal with this problem. And the next step is to find out how cells deal with this problem. If cells couldn't deal with this problem, we wouldn't be here. Additionally, the blockage could be exacerbated if the non-template strand interacts with the downstream duplex to form this HDNA triplex structure. And, um, Finally, in more current studies that I don't have time to go into, but this has just uh, gone in press in nucleic acids research, an undergraduate, Alex Neal, has been studying the effects of transcription arrest when there are strand breaks of different sorts placed in the transcribed DNA strand. Finally, um, in conclusion, mechanisms have evolved to deal with homopurine, homopyridine stretches, as well as non-canonical DNA structures that block transcription. However, rare blockage in these sequences might result in genomic instability and mutagenesis as a consequence of processing by gratuitous transcription coupled repair. And furthermore, some sequences may enhance the damage and exacerbate transcription blockage by lesions such as adoxoguanine. Can we make use of our understanding of transcription coupled repair to devise novel chemotherapeutic modes? Some chemicals, 
uh, such as the erofulvin and eludins, can form DNA addicts that are putatively subject to transcription couple repair, but not to global repair. A particular example is aristocolic acid, which produces DNA addicts that are transparent, are not seen by global repair, but they're recognized strongly by transcription coupled repair. Also, some agents, such as one known as ET743, interacts with transcription coupled repair to produce lethal strand breaks. Uh, a very general conclusion, though, coming back to the complexity, is that any living cell carries with it the experiences of a billion years of experimentation by its ancestors. You cannot expect to explain so wise an old bird in a few simple words. This was delivered by Max Delbruck, one of the founders of the field of molecular biology, when he gave his famous lecture, A Physicist Looks at Biology, five years before the Watson-Crick model for DNA. Progress since that time has been truly spectacular, only 50 years roughly, but we are still just scratching the surface with formidable remaining challenges to an understanding of the remote role of genomic maintenance in human health. Our recent collaborators are listed here. Um, in particular, I might note Sylvia Tornaletti, who for um, a decade spearheaded our studies on how transcription behaves at different kinds of damage. Uh, a current um, collaborator is Sergey Merkin from Tufts University, a, a specialist in non-canonical DNA structures. And here are people who did the work. Uh, Boris Berlatsikovsky has been the senior research associate guiding the studies on transcription in non-canonical DNA. Vivicilinus Rios from Mexico is now a graduate student in um, biology at Harvard, where she continues to study Huntington's disease. Um, Alex Neal is now a graduate student at Tufts University Medical School. Graciela Spivak, who has been working with me for over three decades and is, will be speaking tomorrow, has been an important leader in my group. Uh, several other members who are now retired but show up for the annual picture and also are at our lab meetings and give important advice are Anne Ganeshan and Charles Ellen Smith. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Tenemos tiempo para una sola pregunta. Debemos dejar el salón a las tres y media. Ya estamos sobre la hora. No questions. So, Phil, here you have a certificate and here a little gift from the organizing committee to express all our gratitude for you being here with us. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Gracias, Pedro.